Today marks the launch of our social justice programming. And the purpose of this series of events that we are planning is to really bring our community together and encourage everyone to take part in the movement to ensure civil rights for all. So there'll be a series of events starting with tonight that we hope that you will join us and, and be a part of how we intend to transform our society. And so this evening, we're going to launch our first event and I'm very excited that we are working with our advisors, which is, includes the Newark NAACP, along with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. And so I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, who will take us through a very provocative and dynamic discussion. So Andrea McChristian. Uh, she's the Law and Policy Director at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. She leads the implementation of the strategic vision and the direction of the law and policy program. She served as the director of the Criminal, Criminal Justice Reform Initiative and is the primary author of Bring Our Children Home, Ain't I a Child, which forms the basis of the 150 Years is Enough campaign. Andrea is a graduate of Yale University and Columbia Law School, and we are pleased and delighted to welcome her and the rest of this panel to this forum. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Donna. And good evening, everyone. Um, and I'd also like to again welcome you to tonight's program, Democracy, Voting, Census, A Conversation About Power. Again, my name is Andrew McChristian. I'm the Long Policy Director at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Institute's work, we're a legal policy and advocacy organization based in the mighty city of Newark, New Jersey, whose work focuses around three interconnected pillars, economic justice, democracy and justice, and criminal justice reform. And you can find out more about us at www.njisj.org. Tonight, I'm so thrilled to be the moderator for a conversation with this panel of dynamic women advocates featuring Adorian Murray Thomas, Chanel McLeod, Denise Quijada, and Heno Patel. I'm honored to be able to guide us in a conversation about what it means to be civically engaged and empowered in this critical moment in which we find ourselves. And I'm especially excited, as Donna mentioned, that this is the kickoff event for a series that we're working alongside NJPAC and Newark NAACP to host. And just to provide everyone with a run of show at the beginning, top of the hour, I'm gonna open us up with a few framing remarks. I'll then introduce our esteemed and fierce panel of women who will take a few minutes to provide their own opening statements and reflections. I'll then proceed with a question for each panelist around their areas of expertise. Each panelist will then leave us with a few action items slash next steps so that we can all leave tonight's event with a charge, and then we'll open it up for some audience Q&A before concluding. So if you have any questions that come to mind as the panel is speaking during this program, please feel free to type them in both the Zoom chat or the Facebook live chat, and we'll try our best to get to them at the end. So as I was thinking about how to shape my opening remarks for tonight's panel, I reflected on tonight's theme, democracy voting census, a conversation about power. And out of that, I picked out the word power because I think it speaks so much to so much of what we're seeing in this current moment. While this past weekend, some of us celebrated the 4th of July holiday, recognizing the 244th anniversary of America's independence, others took to the streets to call for an independence that has never existed for Black people in America. Indeed, as we've seen over the past few weeks in 2,000 towns and cities across the nation, people are using the power of their voice to call for change, to call for freedom and to call for transformation. And importantly, while the national uprising we are seeing was sparked by the recent deaths of black people at the hands of the police, including just to name a few, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, George Floyd and Maurice Gordon right here in New Jersey. This moment, as we know, is about so much more than policing. From slavery to sharecropping, to redlining, to over-policing, to mass incarceration, to voter suppression, to continuous generational resource divestment, our country has put in place systems of structural racism that have consistently denied freedom to its Black citizens since before this country's founding. Thus, in response, the national uprising that has occurred as a result of these harms has spoken not only to the need to radically transform the notions of policing and public safety, but it's exposed the need for this country to truly reckon with how its generational divestment in our communities for the past 400 years at least 
can and will no longer be accepted. And this journey of reckoning must begin for us here in New Jersey, where freedom for Black people has long been denied, leading to some of the starkest racial disparities in the nation. For one, New Jersey is home to one of the country's starkest racial wealth gaps. While a white family in New Jersey has a median net wealth of $352,000, the highest in America, a Black family has one of only 6,100. What's more, we're also seeing that Black kids in New Jersey are not being given the same opportunities to thrive as their white counterparts. This is so because here in our state, a Black child is 21 times more likely to be locked up than a white child, giving New Jersey the highest Black to white youth incarceration disparity rate in the nation. We also have the fourth highest Latino to white youth incarceration disparity rate in the nation as well. And as we're seeing across the nation, Black people in New Jersey are not free from police violence with a black New Jersey resident three times more likely to experience force from a police officer than a white resident. And lastly, and what brings us all here tonight, black people in New Jersey are having their right to participate in the democratic process stripped away from them at disproportionate rates, which is especially important as tomorrow is primary day, as we'll discuss in greater detail with the panel. Not only do black people make up around 62% of incarcerated people denied the right to vote in our state while only representing around 15% of the population, but two New Jersey cities, Newark and Jersey City, are the first and second in the nation for the percentage of black people living in hard to count census tracts, which we'll discuss again with the panel. So as we sit with these disparities and realize that freedom has been delayed and denied to black people in our state since they were first brought to the colony, what can be done? Well, at the Institute, we recently developed an action agenda called 10 Ways to Do Racial Justice Advocacy After You Say Black Lives Matter, available on our website, and which my colleague Hennel will speak to in greater depth. And for tonight's program, we'll focus on how we can use our collective voices for power by electing officials who will represent us fervently and effectively, bring needed resources back to our communities through the census, and empower young people to become civically engaged in the next generation of leaders. And importantly, we're not just gonna talk about it, but we're gonna be about it here tonight. With each panelist leaving you with some actionable items you can take to speak truth to power within the democratic process within your own communities. From marching in the streets to marching to the ballot box while being socially distanced, there are many ways to protest, bring about change and show power. And I'm so excited to highlight the many ways we can do so tonight with this amazing panel. So to get us started, I have the honor and privilege of introducing our dynamic panelists and providing them with the space to give some opening remarks to frame their comments here tonight. First, I'm honored to introduce Adorian Murray Thomas. Adorian is the founder and CEO of She Wins Incorporated, a leadership and social action organization for middle and high school girls right here in the mighty city of Newark, New Jersey. Adorian founded She Wins to serve young women who share her story of losing a loved one to gun violence. And today, the organization has served more than 500 girls in the greater Newark area. Adorian has been recognized as a President Obama White House Champion of Change, Glamour Magazine College Woman of the Year, a young futurist in The Root Magazine, and was featured in Essence Magazine's Black Girl Magic docuseries. And Adorian is really Black Girl Magic. She puts that really into words. Adorian recently recently made history where at 23 years old, she became the youngest woman ever elected to the Board of Education in New Jersey's largest school district. Adorian is a 2016 graduate of Swarthmore College and holds a BA in political science and educational studies. Adorian, I'll turn it over to you now to give some opening remarks. Thanks, Andrea. And thank you guys uh, so much for having us. Thank you, NJ Pack, and for everyone who's here today. Um, I have to say, even though it's virtual, I just can feel the love and a hunger for a real robust and honest conversation about how we can move our society and the state forward on the conversations of justice. So again, um, really honored to be here. Um, you know, I'll be brief, but I just want to like offer a few words in terms of how I come into this work. And I come into this work as an educator and a youth advocate. I was born and raised here in the mighty city of Newark, as you say, Andrea. And, you know, I grew up seeing a lot of some of the most resilient and strongest people I know who advocate for this city, who will advocate for their young people and advocate for our families, even in the midst of, of, of huge obstructions and, and, and pain. Uh, and so the question that I'm always asking myself is, are we doing enough? And are we doing enough to really prepare our people 
so they don't have to inherit the same battles and the same battles that their foremothers and forefathers have inherited before them. And I think, unfortunately, that the question is no, we're not doing enough, and we're not doing enough to, uh, to frankly, even prepare our young people to be those leaders and, and game changers in our city that they so that we so desperately need. And so one of the things that I'm really looking forward to in this conversation today, um, I'm not sure, I think I'm seeing the audio a little tricky. Let me know if you guys can hear me a little better now. Um, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to in today's conversation is really reframing the narrative around social justice around young people. Often when we talk about civic engagement and, and social change, we talk about it from a way that puts young people at the periphery, right? So we want to create a world that's better for young people to inherit rather than help co-creating that world with them and giving them space right now to uh, brainstorm and innovate the solutions to some of our society's most critical issues. And so I'm really looking forward to how we reframe conversations around power with focusing on young people as the anchors of that power. And secondly, if we're bold enough to do that, because I think if we're honest about how powerful young people are, part of the reason why so many common narratives around power are afraid to acknowledge how strong and powerful young people are is because when our young people are empowered, they ask questions. And when they ask questions, they hold people accountable. And so we have to really get ready for the questions and answers that our young people actually have to offer. And so I'm looking forward to today's dialogue around uh, civic engagement, around voting, around how we get young people not only out to vote, but before they even get to the ballot box, creating an experience for young people that allows them to know that their voice matters, both before and after the ballot, um, and that they are not just any type of problem that we need to solve, but that they're the solution. Thank you so much, Doreen, for those powerful words. You're breaking up just a little bit um, throughout it, but we heard everything you said. Um, just wanted to note that for you as well, but thank you for that opening. Next, I'm honored to introduce Chanel McLeod. As a native and resident of Newark, New Jersey, Chanel serves as the executive director of Project Ready and has successfully channeled her experiences to become a social activist, empowering hundreds of New Jerseyans to take on leadership roles in their communities. As a leader of Project Ready, Chanel has worked to close the opportunity gap and improve life outcomes for Newark's children by empowering her community to demand excellence from local schools. Her work is centered on growing the base of local voters, mobilizing the voting base to turn out at local elections, very important as we'll see tomorrow, and developing future leaders to improve the city's schools and its future. In the last year, Chanel organized the 1,000 Newarkers Vote by Mail campaign to increase Newark's turnout and successfully advocated for the passage of bills to allow New Jerseyans to register to vote online and expand access to mail-in ballots. Chanel is also the co-founder of the New Jersey Parents Summit, an annual event dedicated to bringing together change makers from across New Jersey. And I've had the pleasure of hearing Chanel speak so many times and she's a wonderful, wonderful addition to the panel. So Chanel, I'll turn it over to you to get some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am so honored and quite frankly humbled to be on this panel with all of you amazing women talking about the most important work and that is democracy, that is voting, that is our census. Uh, as Andrea stated, my name is Chanel McLeod. I'm the executive director of Project Ready, born and raised here in Newark, New Jersey. And for the audience, I'm not sure how many of you have actually had the opportunity to watch Hamilton. Um, it came out this past weekend. It is an amazing, amazing uh, performance that they put on. You can catch it on Disney. One of the things that they talk about um, in, the, in the, the Broadway play, I should say, is they keep asking uh, Alexander Hamilton, why does he write like he's running out of time? And you just see him writing the papers and he's writing like he's running out of time and no one can quite understand it. But meanwhile, he's actually promoting revolutionary change and he's approaching all of his work like he's running out of time. And the message that I, I wanna drive home today, if there's no other message that you get specifically from me, is that we need to be voting like we're running out of time. We need to be active, we need to be uh, calling, and we need to be making sure our friends, 
our family members, and anyone else that we know is voting like we're running out of time. Because unfortunately, what we've seen for decades upon decades, and even most recently, we've seen people like Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, uh, George Floyd, we've seen them be forced to run out of time. And the only way for, or I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the only way because there are a few ways, but one of the most important ways I would say that we can ensure that we have the fair representation that can bring these people to task, people who are quite frankly obliterating our black and brown people is to make sure that we are voting. Uh, a couple of quick things on this because what I've heard from people is people are like, Chanel, you're advocating for voting, you're pushing people to vote, but I don't know if people actually really understand the importance of voting and what it means for them at a local level and what it means for them based on criminal justice reform. Our mayor and or other local, make local government who we elect appoint our chief of police. District attorneys decide when and if an arrest leads to a charge and they are either elected or appointed. Our governor, who we've seen, especially in the midst of COVID-19, plays a role in public safety and security, and they oversee agencies that implement criminal justice and public safety. All politics are local. Our voice matters. In this election on July 7th, and the election coming up in November, and every other election thereafter, People, we have to be educated, we have to be voting, we have to be moving, we have to be speaking out like we're running out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chanel, for those powerful opening remarks. And next, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Denise Quejada. Denise joined Sadie Nash in 2018 as a social work intern and then became a part of their full-time staff in 2020. Denise has been working with diverse communities since the age of 16 when she started volunteering as an EMT in West New York, New Jersey, and later on as a mental health crisis counselor at the local community mental health clinic and hospital. Denise focused her education around working with vulnerable populations and recently graduated with her MSW from Rutgers University. Her concentrations were global social work and immigrant populations, public policy, and community development. Denise continues to focus on communities through her work with Sadie Nash's partnership and census programs that focuses on bringing important resources and social justice awareness to communities in New York City and Newark. And we've had the pleasure of hosting Sadie Nash, um, young women at our uh, organization, and they're just phenomenal, phenomenal young future leaders. So I'm excited to turn it over to Denise now to give her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Andrea. It is, I am deeply humbled to be here and honored to be on a panel with such amazing women. And thank you to NJ Pack for opening up this opportunity to have a honest and informative discussion around the census. You know, I think across the country with, and within, you know, obviously working within Sadie Nash and us having our own youth program with the census, it's clear that our youth are not aware of the importance of our census. You know, it's not something that's necessarily mentioned in school, yet it only happens every 10 years so it's really easy for that type of educative information to potentially fall through the cracks you know we're seeing youth being activated in wanting to create real change long-lasting change in the communities that they belong to the census is an important civic duty to ensure that we're all accurately represented in the country it is a mandatory national survey conducted every 10 years that aims to collect information on the population of the United States. It is written into our constitution because the information collected is that important in determining how we get federal funding, um, you know, and even our political representation. And some of the federal funding programs is, you know, it's, and it's determined based on the number of people that live in the area and that eligibility and that amount of money. And some of the programs that, the, that this money funds are our Medicaid, our SNAP, our, our SNAP, our workforce programs for youth and adults, and as well as like community development grants. It also determines the amount of legislators representing our state in the 
House of Representatives in Congress. In New Jersey, we currently have 12 congressional districts. The census determines how many congressional districts we have, meaning how many representatives uh, represent New Jersey in the House of Congress. So we currently have 12. In the 1980, 1990, and 2010 census, each one of those years, we lost seats. We used to have 15. So that's three less representatives that we have in Washington. For the 2010 census, New Jersey had a 67 response rate compared to the national percent average of 76. So we're already below that. And while it may sound bad, you know, and in May 67, it's still higher than 50. But when you think of like New Jersey and we have 8 million people living in our, in our state, that amounts to potentially two to three people who didn't risk two to three million people who didn't respond. And that's a lot of inaccuracy in terms of representing the population in New Jersey, you know? And so when you think in specifically, when you think about Newark, we only, Newark only had a 51% uh, response rate in 2010 compared to the 76. However, when you look at Maplewood in the 2010 census, they had a 78% self-response rate. We've seen, you know, the census wants to say that our communities are hard to count, but we've seen what language can do to belittle the places that we live in. Our communities are not hard to count, but in fact, they are historically undercounted due to the lack of awareness and education around the long-term implications of not answering the census. How else do you explain the difference in self-response rates between two neighboring cities? How many of you actually learned about the census in school? You know, earlier this year, earlier this year, we observed attempts to discourage participation in the 2020 census through the addition of trying to add the addition of a citizenship question and the inappropriate forms of collecting responses about race and gender. While the citizenship question was not added, the damage was done in creating a distrust in answering the census. The data, the data collected in the 1940 census was used to locate Japanese Americans and place them in internment camps. However, since then, the Census Bureau has worked hard to instill laws and other protective measures to prevent this from ever happening again because their goal at the end of the day is to provide an accurate census. That is the main goal of the Census Bureau. You, and so this, you know, and some of the protective measures includes fines and jail terms for employees who release information. It prevents this information, the information entered into the census from being used uh, in a court of law against you. And, you know, and I think at the end of the day, as a community, we cannot let our voices be silenced and let this that this important civic duty passes by because the next chance that we get to do this won't happen for another 10 years. So when you think about the long-term implications of not answering this census, there's an, they, there are implications that can last 10 years, if not longer than that. So thank you all, everyone. Thank you, Denise. I think you brought up an important question about civics education, which I know we'll get into a little more in the discussion. So last but certainly not least, I have the privilege of introducing my colleague at the Institute, Henel Patel. Henel's director of the Democracy and Justice Program at the Institute. Before joining us, she was an associate at McElroy, Deutsch, Mulvaney, and Carpenter. Previously, Henel had the honor of serving as a law clerk to Chief Justice Stuart Rabner on the New Jersey Supreme Court. While in law school, Henel was an Eagleton Institute of Politics fellow, participated in the Constitutional Litigation Clinic, and served as an assistant to the chairman of the New Jersey Redistricting Commission. Hennel received her JD from the Rutgers University School of Law Newark and BA from Rutgers University. And I may be partial, but Hennel's just a phenomenal and excellent attorney and advocate. And so I'll turn it over to you, Hennel, to do your opening statement. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, it's an honor to work with you every day. Um, and it's an honor to be here today on this panel with these amazing women. Thank you so much to NJ Pack for um, inviting us, but also for uh, wanting to discuss this topic. This incredibly important topic is um, especially in this moment. I was reading this weekend that right now the protests happening, the Black Lives Matter protests happening by sheer number of people on the streets is the largest protest movement in American history. So that's the backdrop we're, sp uh, we're speaking in. That's democracy in action, right? The protest is democracy. So I was thinking about that when I was preparing for today's um, discussion. And I had, an, I had, I was speaking to some college students earlier today. And one of them asked me a question that's been, that's, I answered and has been sticking with me all day as I've been preparing for this. She asked, 
what do I think is the biggest voting issue we have? And the interesting thing is like, you know, we all can answer, um, you know, a lot of um, my fellow panelists mentioned a lot of the problems we have, you know, people aren't responding to the census. We don't have, we need to have, there's any number of things I could have said. We should have same day registration. We should restore voting rights to people with criminal, everyone with a criminal conviction. We should, so many things we could say. We should have mandatory civics education because it's true. Kids, we don't teach our kids about civics education. But any, not all of the, any number of those things are necessary and all of them are necessary. So what's the root problem? And it comes down to this. We as a, country, we as a society, we in the state, do not have a culture that really truly believes in voting, believes in the right to vote. A lot of us say we do, a lot of us, you know, really believe in voting, but as a culture, do we believe in the right to vote as a fundamental part of our democracy? And the reason why we don't is because we never have as a country. <laughs> um, it comes down to the fact that in this country, this amazingly flawed country, we are, we happen to be the oldest existing continuous democracy right now in the world, a beacon of democracy, if you will. And yet from day one, it's been flawed. It's been sullied by the fact that we didn't consider everyone people. We don't consider everyone people. and. Every single instance, all through our history, we have always, always put restrictions on who can vote and how we can vote. From the first day, even when we had expansive voting uh, for a lot of people, it was either tied to you had to be free, you had to be a man, or you had to own property because it just wasn't something we believed in as we deserved as a person, that you as a person deserve to have the right to vote because you are a person in this democracy, that this is a fundamental human right and as a human you have this, we have never had that. And we have passed on this lack of a culture and believing in the right to vote from day one. And it is continued so that every single voting rights victory has been hard fought, hard fought, including in, in multiple, in an occasion, an actual civil war to get to the 15th amendment. Then we needed another generation to get to the 19th Amendment. And none of that really mattered for Black women until we had the Voting Rights Act. And then we still needed time to get to the 26th Amendment to even let 19, 20, 18 year olds to vote. And so we come to today. And what can we do now, especially in this big mass democracy movement that's happening? And I will implore everyone here, and I do believe that there's, if you're listening here, you care enough. Try to change that change that part of the culture because if we truly had a, a, a culture a society that believed in the right to vote then every single restriction to the right to vote would be met with deep skepticism because that right now every time we fight for a voting rights issue every single time and i've done it and i am so blessed to be able to do this work truly truly it isn't um a, the it, it, I'm so privileged to be able to do this. I make arguments. I talk to people of, in public education campaigns. I talk to legislators and we go, hey, why? This is why you should restore voting rights to people with a criminal conviction. This is why it's important. It'll help with rehabilitation. This is why we should do this. Here's why we should have same day registration. We shouldn't have an arbitrary deadline. People are quarantining. All of these arguments I'll make, it's great. But in reality, the argument should be made by them. <laughs> In reality, it should be them having to justify why we need a restriction at all. It shouldn't come to us to have to prove why we shouldn't have a restriction. That is not how a human right works. And we're just not there <laughs> as, a, as a culture, and we should be. And we can be, especially in this moment. So that is what I hope we can talk about and think about today. And I hope you guys can take that with you from our discussion. Thank you, Hennel. So as you can see, you're all in for a treat tonight with a really diverse set of voices around the issue of democracy, voting, and census. So with that, I want to get right into the questions. So the first one I have is for Chanel. We're currently sitting in a powerful and critical moment. Over the past several weeks, we've watched as people have taken to the streets across the nation to speak out against the numerous injustices that have befallen our communities. Can you speak to how and why, as a next step in this powerful moment, we must ensure that people turn out to the polls both tomorrow here in New Jersey 
and for the upcoming November elections. And please also elaborate on anything you feel the audience needs to know for tomorrow's primary election. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to I wanna touch a little bit on what uh, my colleague uh, um, Hanal said in the beginning about why we're not voting, why is this happening? And I want to add a little bit to that. Being born and raised here in Newark, New Jersey, and having parents who like prior they prioritized me making it out of Newark, New Jersey at the time when Newark, New Jersey was not what it is today. That was their priority. And what that looked like is making sure that I got a quality education and it didn't look like anything else for them. Why? Because they had a lot on their plate and they were still trying to figure out ways to make ends meet. And what that positioned them as a family and like most families that I've gotten to know over the time being a Newark resident and being in this career is that you find that parents and families are working to make ends meet. Parents and families are dealing with traumas from past. Parents and families are, are doing the best that they can with what they have um, and trying to figure out ways to secure more resources. And as a result of not being able to always have all of these things together, they often miss the additional conversation that needs to happen, which is why are we voting? How are we holding elected officials accountable? How are we holding legislate, legislators accountable? The list goes on. And so I bring that up because even growing up for me, getting involved in this work, I didn't know the first thing about what my mayor was accountable for. I didn't understand what legislators were supposed to do. I did not understand how democracy actually worked uh, because I didn't know that it was supposed to be a priority. And now more than ever, now that I've gotten deeper into this work, now that I've read more, now that I've been around enough people and seen how legislation passed around me impacts me directly, I am now not only a fierce advocate for voting, but looking to create an organization like Project Ready that allows for people to have the additional tools and resources they need when they have existing full plates to make sure that they are understanding voting, understanding education, uh, the education surrounding voting, and turning out at higher numbers than we see here in Newark. The bottom line for, for me is I believe that people are not voting because they are not voting as an act of self-care. And this is legitimately the mo one of the most important points for me because I, for years, did not prioritize my own self-care. I didn't understand what it looked like for me to prioritize my voice, for me to prior prioritize getting to know my truth, for me to be doing yoga and meditation and eating healthy. I didn't understand any of those things. I just understood that I needed to work hard, I needed to do the best that I could, and I needed to be a, a beacon of hope, if you will, in Newark, New Jersey, and bringing on other beacons of hope. Once people start to prioritize their own self-care, then people will start to see voting as an act of self-care, filling out their senses as an act of self-care, and then people will be able to transition into actually prioritizing, showing up at the polls, holding elected officials accountable and making sure that they're joining people like us in order to lobby. Um, so I just, I, I wanted to make sure that I drove that point home. I think our communities, our urban communities do not prioritize self-care enough. And once we can start prioritizing self-care, then we will start to prioritize voting and filling out our census, et cetera. Um, uh, I think what was mentioned among other colleagues is that we are in a very powerful moment. Um, and according to a New York Times article that just came out, um, we've seen this movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, as one of the largest movements that have happened across history. Um, even the civil rights movement, and not to uh, diminish the power of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, but even that movement did not see as many people showing up as much as 142 protests per day as we're seeing right now. And I think what that signs to me is that people, similar to what I said earlier, understand that we are running out of time and there is an important movement that we need to be a part of in order to reimagine reimagine what it looks like for us to have a nation, a democracy that honors all people and promotes equity for all. But that's just the first step. 
The next step after that is to make sure that we're voting. I, I know someone mentioned in the comments, we are voting, but elected officials are doing whatever we want, whatever they want. I think what has to happen after we vote is that we have to make sure that we're holding those elected officials 100% accountable. Um, additionally, in Newark, New Jersey, 46% of Newarkers showed out, turned out to vote in the 2016 presidential. 46%. Some people may say that's great. I say that's not enough. I say that we need more. I dream of a day where we can say in, from the July 7th primary, November and beyond, that we're seeing any more than 80% or higher of, of people that are turning out to vote. And then we're seeing them joining us side by side, lockstep for lobbying. And we're seeing them even running for something even running for something afterward because they believe that they have something inside of them that can overall represent the community. So just to, to bring it all full circle, voting is an act of self-care. We have to own our own self-care. We're in the middle of a pivotal movement. And the only way to take this pivotal movement to the next phase is to make sure that we're turning people out to vote in larger numbers and we're lobbying to make sure we hold people accountable. Sorry, I know that was long. <laughs> no, that was perfect. And I like this idea of voting as self-care because that's a new reframing of what it means to vote and why it's so important to do so. So I love that. And so my next question is for Adorian. Adorian, we've seen time and time again and are seeing now in the current moment how youth voice and power, and I know a lot of people are asking the comments about youth voice, is critical to changing systems and structures. As someone who works to educate, empower, and develop youth to serve as advocates for their communities, why do you think it's so important, especially now in this current moment, that youth turn out to vote? Also beyond that, what more do you think is needed to educate, develop, and empower the youth vote? Yeah, I mean, so I, I love that we're talking about all of this within like the current context, right? Because it's a really wonderful and challenging, of course, a moment that we're in, like most social political movements. Oh, um, and okay. I just think you're breaking up again. I don't know if whatever you did before where you moved a little bit. That okay. How about now? What if I come closer to the computer? Is that better? Yep. Yes. Okay. Man, this virtual thing is something. It's like one minute everything's <laughs> working, the next minute there's a, a conflict. But no, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it's a really interesting moment we're in politically, right? So we see that like most social and civic movements in this country, it's been run um, in part, in large part, by the voice of young people. One of the largest protests that we had for the Black Lives Matter in, in, in Nashville, Tennessee, just a few weeks ago, was organized by two teenagers on Instagram, right? Um, the, the, the big protest that we had here in Newark um, a few weeks ago, where 12,000 people, obviously, uh, some time. What what we can do is if we want to move to the next panelist and if we come back, let's do that. Would that be okay? Yeah. All right. we'll, All right, I'll figure it out. All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll turn to Hennel. So Hennel, the COVID nineteen pandemic has led to a new frontier in the voting process with vote by mail taking on increased importance in the election process, especially now. Um, in this moment where many may have questions and concerns about voting during an international pandemic, why do you feel that people should still trust in the voting process and what protections are in place, including for tomorrow, to ensure every vote is counted? Absolutely, thank you so much. And you know, we've been receiving questions about this a lot in the last few weeks as we get into this election and it is, a different format of election. You know, we've never had an election like this. It's um, so there's obviously whenever you have a change like that, people are understandably a little confused or concerned about what's happening. So first and foremost, vote. It is incredibly important to vote. As my co-panelist has said, it is so, so important. You know, there are people, basically everyone on this panel, so many other people who are working every day to ensure that everyone has access to the ballot, that you have the right to vote. At the same time, it is really, at the end of the day, a personal thing. You have to ensure you have the right to vote and that you, uh, that you actually do, in fact, vote. And if you have concerns about it, just generally speaking, for the, tomorrow's election, it is safe to vote. Go do it. 
what are, if whatever concerns you have, ask the questions, the answers are available. It is the biggest thing, the biggest concern people have with this election is the fact that it's different. So people have questions, but here's the thing about this. Last year we did, oh, so the, earlier this year, actually, we released a report called Our uh, Vote, Our Power, um, and it, uh, dealt, it dealt with why there's low voter turnout, and we, had, we made policy recommendations about, um, uh, to address it. The basis of that report was ask, uh, we asked questions to people in Newark. We, did, um, uh, we partnered with a, um, a firm who did ethnographic research. We asked people around the city why, why they're not voting, what the concern is. And one answer always struck me and has struck with me since I read that is that there were multiple people who said, you know what, I didn't know enough and I didn't want to feel dumb. I did it, it was, you know, you just, if you don't know enough, you're like, what if I make a wrong choice? I don't know. I'd, I'd rather not make a decision, not do this, than feel like I'm dumb or stupid or don't know enough. And so the first thing you have to, I have to say is that there is no dumb question about, about the right to vote. If you have a question, ask it. There are answers available. So first off, I'm just going to go through a few of them. There are people who are concerned about, is it safe to vote by mail? Yes. Yes, it is. For the, if, <laughs> voting by mail is, in fact, safe. Um, there is no concern with it. You can vote at home. If, you're, if you have questions about how to vote by mail um, and how to fill it out, a lot of county clerks have put out videos that will walk you through the process. Watch it. Vote right now put it in the mail. If you have concerns about a delay in, um, get, uh, um, in the mail, fair enough. You know, right now we have a pandemic. You might be concerned that, you, um, that your mail not, might, might not get there in time. Keep in mind, you can, as long as it's postmarked by tomorrow, tomorrow, and it's received within seven days, it'll count. So what do you do if you're concerned about the mail? Great question. One, you can go drop it off at a secure Dropbox. And I'm going to share my screen and so you can find out, uh, so I can tell you where exactly to look to find out your secure Dropbox location. Um, a secure Dropbox is every single county has to have five of them. Those are, they're similar to mailboxes. They just cut out the post office from the process, USPS. So you put it in there and the county collects it directly. There are five per county, a minimum of. This is the Secretary of State's website. I'll scroll up, you can see it. Secretary of State, New Jersey, you can Google the website, go to the Division of Election right there up top, and you scroll down and it says right here, um, a, a bunch of useful information. First off, vote by mail, ballot, Dropbox location. Click on it, um, you have to click twice, get a PDF, go find your county, find your five locations, Go put, drop off your ballot in one of them tomorrow and you know the county will get it. Great. If you still have concerns or if you didn't get your ballot, it happens. You can go in person to the county until 8 p.m. tomorrow, apply, oh, get your ballot, vote there, hand it right back to them. And if you still have any concerns or, hey, you didn't, go, you didn't get your application, you didn't get your ballot, the county is really far, a county clerk's office is far away, what do you do? This is why the, um, the Institute, our partners, we advocated strongly for this. We said we need to expand and encourage vote by mail, but you have to have in-person polling places available because there are people who cannot or will not vote by mail. You need to have this option available, and we do. Every single municipality in the state of New Jersey has at least one polling place. Every county, uh, well, one possible, have at least about half their polling places open. So tomorrow you can go vote in person. How, where do you vote? It's not necessary. It might be your normal polling place. It might not be. Where do you go? Again, state of New Jersey website, which is why this is still open. Find your polling place. Click on that one. Put in your street address. It'll tell you where you can go vote in person tomorrow. That's how simple it is. Go vote. Go vote tomorrow. I want to say, um, clarify a couple of things. If you vote in person tomorrow, the vast majority of people are going to be voting um, by provisional ballot. Unless you have a, a disability under the ADA and you need to vote by machine, you're going to be voting by provisional ballot. So you might have a concern there. By either uh, The provisional ballot is going to be counted the same as a vote by mail ballot. You may have heard, we just had in May a bunch of um, municipal elections, about over 30 of them in the state of New Jersey. There was a pretty high level of rejection rate. Um, it was about 10% of ballots. That is terrible, truly terrible. And you may have heard about that or you may have experienced it yourself and I'm sorry about that. 
one of the main reasons people's ballots are rejected, either vote, have been rejected in the past, either by vote by mail or provisional, is because of signature match. So New Jersey has had a longstanding policy that when you vote by mail or provisional ballot, your signature is compared to your signature in your voter file. That's just how they verify that it was you, in fact, who voted. Now, the problem is, you can imagine, is the signature match pro uh, issue. Everybody's, uh, you know, signatures change all the time. You know, people's signatures change day to day. They certainly change over time. So there are people that, uh, where you had um, them comparing signatures to their voter registration form that's like 30 years old. So, and the people who are comparing it, they're not handwriting experts, they're people at the county. And they're like, oh, it doesn't look close enough. They rejected the ballot for those reasons. And they'll tell you afterward, They'll say, they, um, like Essex County, Mom County, a lot of counties, they'll send you a letter afterwards saying, hey, we rejected your ballot because of a signature match. Can't do anything about it, but that's what we've been doing. That is a terrible policy. No one's ballot should be thrown out like that. You vote, you want to make sure your vote counted. You shouldn't have to worry when you, when you go vote that your vote might not count for something like this and you didn't even know about it. So fortunately, the Institute with our partners sued in federal court on behalf of the NAACP state conference, League of Women Voters in New Jersey, and a handful of individual plaintiffs. And we said, this process doesn't work. We need a new process. So the litigation well, I don't know why I can't see while we work on a long-term solution, but for tomorrow, we have a settlement in place. Tomorrow's policy is gonna be, we, there is a notice and cure procedure. So when you vote, vote by mail, provisional, whichever way you do it, do vote. Um, if you, when they look at it in the county, they're going to compare signatures. If they see an issue, they have to send you notice within 24 hours. They will send you um, a notice and a cure form. You fill out that cure form, send it back either by mail or in person, by fax, um, online, um, by email, and you, you have until July 23rd to send it back and say, you basically fill it out saying, no, no, that was my ballot, count it. And that way, a lot of ballots will not be thrown out. This will fix a lot of the issues you may have heard of when you, um, when you heard about concerns about this election. So just as a whole, trust that you have, uh, trust the system as a whole. It's not perfect. Our democracy is not perfect. Everyone's working on it though. Know that there are people trying to make it better. Know that we are doing this and also make sure that you as a, um, uh, ensure your right to vote. If you have a concern tomorrow or today, a big issue that you think is a problem, call. 1866 vote 1-866-VOTE. There are people manning that right now, the Election Protection Coalition in New Jersey. We are trying to address this issue, any issues you might have. But issues have always existed in voting. It's a, it's a system that generally works. It is something that you can trust. Generally, your vote will count for the, it is trustworthy. So do, do vote, um, do trust it, and do this. And then just, you know, ensure, just in case there's an issue, reach out and we can help resolve it. Okay, thanks so much, Hannah. Adoring, we're gonna turn it, we're gonna turn it back to you. I feel it this time. I know we got can it. Um, can just you hear me? <laughs> yep, we hear you, clear. We're gonna turn it back to you. Same question about the youth vote. Why is it important? How do we get more youth turnout? And what do we need to educate and empower the youth to understand the importance of the democratic process? Absolutely, I mean, so it's difficult to look at any social or political moment of victory in this country and not see the voices and stories of young people at the center. Whether we're looking at the civil rights movement, or we're looking at protests of the war of Vietnam, if we're looking to just a few weeks ago, right, with the, the national Black Lives Matter movement, there have been young people at the helm. And so if to so the question of why is it important that we have youth turnout, is that, you know, when we ask young people what they want and what they need, they let us know, right? They keep it as the kids say, they keep it 100 with us. They are honest. They make, us, they make it clear and they hold us accountable. I think the question becomes, are we ready for what it is young people have to say? So when we even think about, you know, the, the conversation of civics uh, education came up here. And when you think about just what civics education looks like across the country, you know, there are 11 states in this country that don't require any type of civics education. New Jersey is one of those states. New Jersey does not require that we teach young people about the civic system and how to engage. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we, even when it comes down to legislation, right? Are we creating a space where young people are empowered with the tools to know how to engage um, in, in the civic sphere? And the question is, we're, we're, we're not doing enough. Um, 
I think another thing too, particularly when we're talking about uh, black and brown students who unfortunately often are at the margin socioeconomically, I think it's really important that we tell our young people who they are, where they come from, so that they know that they are capable of greatness and that their simple casting a ballot is actually bigger than just casting a ballot, right? Because they're doing something that was hard fought for by people who came before them. And so that comes down to what we actually teach our students. Uh, you guys are clearly an engaged and informed panel, so you all are probably familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of our audience is familiar with the fact that New Jersey has a piece of legislation called the Amistad legislation, which has been on the books since 2002, that mandates that all students in the state of New Jersey learn about African American history in, in the diaspora uh, more broadly. We also know that the implementation of that legislation has been fairly, uh, you know, inconsistent. And, and, and the amount of work that has been done on Amistad um, has not been because of simply the goodwill of systems, but it's been because because of the resistance and the pushing and the questions coming from community organizers like the NAACP who co-advised this uh, event, like the young people that we're talking about. Um, so I think when we talk about how to engage young people, one, we have to create spaces where they know their history and know who they are, know that they're capable of greatness and know that they have a responsibility to pay that greatness forward. Lastly, I think that we have to really wrestle with, when we say that all voices, right, young voices or, or just, you know, voices more broadly matter, we have to really be honest about, like, whose voices are we saying matter, right? I vividly remember last year when I was running for office for the school board here in Newark and canvassing on, on MAPES in the South Ward of Newark, meeting a bunch of incredible people, and I met this young brother. He couldn't have been much younger than me telling him about why I was running and you know why it was important to me that young people look on the board and see people who look like them, see people who also clearly just graduated high school and college recently so they feel that that's kind of that relatability. And I did all this conversation with him and he said, well, you know, sis, I will vote for you, but I can't. I have a record and I'm not allowed to vote, right? And so when we talk about saying that voices matter and that young voices matter, Whose voices do we say really matter, right? So that was in 2019. Now, I'm happy to say that in 2020, New Jersey has legislation not, and we have to thank organizations like New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and incredible organizations like you all for making sure this legislation came to pass so that folks with uh, criminal records can actually vote. But, you know, that's kind of like a, an explicit way in which we are telling a certain member or certain groups of the electorate that your voices don't count. But there are implicit ways, less explicit ways, but implicit ways that we are sending those same messages. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to one, what we teach young people in school and, and the gaps in our Masada curriculum, gaps in civics curriculum are some of them. I, I'm happy to say that in North Public Schools, we're doing a lot of incredible work to bridge that gap. We have an incredible superintendent. We have an incredible group of board members. We have an incredible, honestly, an incredible dynamic group of parents and community organizers who hold us accountable to making sure that we get this work done. So there's a lot of great things happening here in the city of Newark that I'm proud to say uh, on this, in, the, in the question of civic engagement and uh, uh, kind of culturally relevant engagement and curriculum, but there's still a lot more work to do. Um, and, and it does come back to how we, we value students um, and, and which voices matter. What, one last thing I'll say, see, I'm trying to get a lot out since I had all these audio issues. I'm like, I need to share, share something with y'all that I was planning on um, talking about. But I'm really, I'm often thinking about, you know, do our young people believe that we believe their voices matter? Right? That the theme of this conversation is, is not, is, and the title isn't just about kind of voting and census, but also this notion of power. And who holds power? How do we get it? And who do we believe is powerful? And if I'm being honest, and I, you know, I work with young people, I talk to young people every day, either through She Wins or the young people that I engage as a school board member. And I, 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 it hurts me to say that I don't believe that our young people truly believe that we think that they are powerful and that their power isn't something that just needs to be controlled or tamed or referenced when we're trying to just figure out how to have a strong social media presence, right? Young people know whether or not we truly value their voices. 
And so when we ask the question of, well, why is it that in 2014, only around 11% of people between the ages of 18 and 29 came out to vote in the state of New Jersey, let's be honest about like how we've been really engaging them both in schools, in the public sphere, outside of these kind of formal spaces to really let our young people know that their voices matter to us. So we have a lot of work to do. And so if I was gonna leave with like both a, a specific ask and then kind of a bigger ask, I think the specific one is, is, is twofold, right? If you know any students who are over, over 18 or young people who just graduated 18, make sure they're registered to vote. Um, as we know, the primary is tomorrow. So unfortunately, if registration papers weren't in by, uh, I believe it was about two weeks ago, they may not be able to vote in the primary, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to vote in November, right? So register the young people in your sphere to vote. And then secondly, have real honest conversations with young people. If you go to the comment section on these Instagram posts, be it on the Shade Room or some Instagram page, young people are having, honestly, the same conversations we're having but they're using different language, right? So it's not like our young people aren't thinking about these issues. It's not like they don't even have the solutions for them. I, I would dare say that in the two conversations I had with young people today before this call, I got more clarity in some of those conversations I had with them than I've had with the adults in the past week, right? So it's not like our young people don't have the answers. I think the question is, are we ready to listen to them? And so we have a lot of work to do on that front. Um, and, and I'm truly looking forward to the ways in which we can kind of bridge some of these um, intergenerational divides that sometimes exist in the civic sphere about what power looks like, about who holds it, and about how we hold those once they get the power, right, accountable to doing the work we elected them to do. I, I'm going to end with this. The, my favorite things as school board members, as, as a school board member at board meetings, is seeing young people come up to that podium asking questions, holding myself and our school board members and our superintendent accountable. Um, and so that's what it's about. It's about us reminding our young people of them power, of their power, and not being afraid when they use it to, to hold us accountable. Thank you, Dora. I think that's such an important point where too many times we say we speak on behalf of youth instead of letting youth speak for themselves because they have, they, to your point, they have the answers and solutions. We just have to listen to them and give them a seat at the table. Um, and so last but not least, I'll turn it over to Denise. Um, Denise, in this moment, we're seeing calls across the nation for reinvestment of funding into key community services and resources, particularly in our black and brown communities. As you know, one method of bringing need resources to these communities is through an accurate census count. However, it seems that for many, while they're familiar with the importance of the census, generally, they don't have a real understanding of what it means to them, because as we know before, they don't get taught it in school. Um, can you elaborate on why the census is important, why we all need to be counted, and what an accurate census count means for community investment and power? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. So, you know, I think a really great starting point is to talk about like our youth programming camp census and, you know, and as we're trying to figure out a curriculum that critically looks at the census and how it affects communities of color, we thought what would be the most impactful. And so CUNY developed this hard to count mount, even though we refer to it as historically undercounted, where you can look up your own communities, exactly put in your address, find out exactly how you responded to the census. And what a lot of a lot of our Nashers, a lot of our youth participants saw was that their communities didn't do well in the census, you know, and that's where you start the conversation, right? Like, what does this mean to me? How does this affect me? And I think to kind of also come off a point from what Adorian was saying was that we don't give the youth the power to think that they can they can spread the word and the awareness of the census right we have the problem with the civics education not understanding where the funding really happens and so the way that really happens is that the census is in charge of five big federal block grants so those five big grants are, are, are sent to the states and given to states based on the number of people that are living in certain areas, right? And when we see specifically that our communities of color, low income communities of color, there is a really poor sense of self response is that you see how it's affected. It's that there's not enough community, there's not enough funding to really be able to help the people who live there. And I think that when you also start to have this conversation about the census, right? And then you also think about how it affects our political representation. I mentioned earlier how we've lost three, three seats, but, and I wanna incorporate also voting into the census because people think that the census is just this survey, you fill out, all it tells you is about 
about the household, but they don't understand the long-term implications. And especially this year, voting is more important now. And not that it's not important, right? And then just, but just it's really important now because the people, the, the people that are elected now in your state legislator are the people who are going to be redistricting a state. So what does that mean? When you, every 10 years, what happens is that based on the number of populations, a, the federal government tells states, you can have this many districts and this many representatives in your state based on population. So if population is inaccurate, we don't have the right, so we don't have the accurate number of people living in an area. And what that also does is that it leaves it open for for, for politicians to potentially not draw districts in ways that are appropriate, right? If we don't vote for the people that we want representing us, um, then you're not getting the right representation in districts, and right? And what this potentially could lead to is gerrymandering, right? And we've had, con we've heard about the term, maybe some of us haven't, but pretty much gerrymandering is the intentional drawing of districts to either help certain communities or not help other communities. Um, and I have a picture, I think Danielle might have it. If not, I can try to screen share it real quick. Actually, I think I can. And so this picture shows, so on the left, you see a district that is 60% blue, 40% red. In an ideal world, this district in the number one would be separated where you would see three equal blue districts and two equal red districts. And what, so, or even the other, but you see how there's potential for manipulation of drawing these districts in ways that are beneficial to bipartisan power. And the picture below that actually shows the intentional redistricting in North Carolina to include communities um, with uh, communities with large um, populations of Black and Latinx communities to be one district. So instead of those votes potentially counting for whatever you know for whatever partisan may may be in play. Um, it actually groups it all those voters into one district. So that's also can be very damaging and these districts stay with us for 10 years. So I think what's really important is that the census is not a stand a piece uh, uh, a stand up. It's not a part of a civic action that is standing alone. It has all these multiple layers that it affects and, uh, and you know, and comes into play into our communities. Um, you know, and a lot of people are saying now that the census is one of the passive, you know, things that you can do as a social justice movement is being counted, being represented. This is something that you can do from home that takes 10 questions, you know, to, it, it, it takes 10 questions and 10 minutes to complete. And what are, what we're really seeing too is that there, there are obviously a lot of systemic reasons why the census isn't encouraged in certain communities, you know, and when you start looking at the census being promoted, right, already uh, the LA Times um, disclosed or mentioned how census data is already showing that non-whites under, under 16 outnumber all of those who identify as white. Right. This is powerful information for our communities, especially at a time right now when we, you know, when there's so many protests, when there's so much wonderful radical speech about how things need to change. And so, you know, when you think about all of these different intersections and you think about youth in particular, you know, I, I remember attending early on with my census work, attending like um, kind of a work group. And I remember thinking like, we should locate schools and talk to our youth and inform them about the census. And somebody was so dismissive and was like, no, what for? Like, they don't need to answer the census or like, no, it's going to be the parents who are doing this. But how how often are we seeing our youth being agents for their families, right? Our youth being there for their families and trying to navigate all these different systems. And so like with the census, we felt it was so important to incorporate our youth into that because it's just important for them to really understand and know about. And like I said, at the end of the day, this is not going to affect those that are older, right? This is gonna affect those that are gonna be here in the next 10 years. It's gonna affect our youth, or it's gonna affect our children. They said that children is one of the populations least entered in the census. People just don't realize that they should be including newborns. They should be including their children into the census. This is another misconception about it. And so when you think about what thing that 
you can do, right? And what thing that anyone can really do. Maybe you don't want to protest, you know, maybe you have your reservations about voting, even though you really shouldn't, like voting is so important. But this is something that you can do from the comfort of your home. It's online, it's on the phone, it's available in over 150 languages if you wanted to answer it. And there are people who are willing to walk you through, the, through the, every single step of the process as needed. And I think that the, un, another thing that's important to note is that when the census doesn't get your response, there's two things that potentially happen. One is that they get people sent, that they're gonna send enumerators or door knockers or organizers who come to your home, right? Potentially putting themselves at risk, potentially putting others at risk. So, you know, they, because this information is so important and it needs to be collected. And the other thing that happens is that if the census doesn't get your information, if your family is already involved in some kind of a federal programming or state programming, they have your information already. So it's not necessarily that you're going to be giving information that the government didn't have. But if you have a newborn child, if you have certain changes in your family that they may not be aware of, then the accurate, then the information is inaccurate. They say the census says that the most accurate information is when you are self-responding and filling out those forms on your own. Um, so thank you. I hope I answered the question, Andrea. Wonderful, definitely, Denise. I really like the visual because that was really helpful to see how important this process is in our representation. And so thank you all for those wonderful remarks. And so before we turn it to audience Q&A, if you all could take a couple of minutes, because uh, I know we want to get to audience Q&A, just to lift up any takeaways, next steps, action items you all have that people can leave with. And Adorian, I know you have lifted this up a little bit as well. Um, and so I'll go in reverse and start with Denise. Are there any action items, parting words you want to leave people with in a couple of minutes? Absolutely. You know, just complete the census. Complete the census. There's so much information out there. Um, that you can just become, that you have questions about the census, it's there. The information is there. It's a matter of whether you're, you want to look for it or not. And sometimes the information isn't um, as accessible, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it's an important thing and you should be encouraging everyone who you know to complete the census. And it's online now, so it's super easy. Great, thank you. Kennel? Yes, hi everyone. So first off, let me just clear up something. I think I uh, spoke really quickly or misspoke, but when I said, if you want to call, if you have a question, it's one eight six six our vote I may have just said vote um, or spoke really quickly. Our vote if you have any issue. Um, there were some questions about tracking your ballot once your ma ballot is in. Great question. I want to address it to everybody. Um, there is a website on the state, uh, Secretary of State's um, site that lets you, um, you can register and um, track your ballot if, however, Sometimes there's issues with being able to register. So you can also either counter, call your county officials or you can call 1-866-NJ-VOTER, um, 1-877-NJ-VOTER. Um, and um, that way, you know, that, um, that'll let you um, be able to track your ballot after you've mailed it in if you have questions. I just wanna share a couple of things that um, really quickly that you can do take away from this. And the first is going to be the Institute has released a document um, that Andrea mentioned earlier called 10, 10 Things You Can Do Right Now. 10 things that you, uh, concrete steps you can take to bring racial justice here in New Jersey. So um, to get a re reach it, you could just have to go to njisa.org forward slash 10 dash things like I have on the screen. And here's the actual document um, that you can see. And it starts, it has just clear step by steps what you can do. It's laid out here so you can print it. Um, so that's why the numbers are like this, not because it's a mistake, um, but it starts here and it's actually just concrete steps you can take right here in New Jersey on policing, on youth justice, on, on voting rights and taking the census, on um, economic justice to act, close the racial wealth gap. So please, we encourage you to take this. And then next I wanted to share one more document and this actually addresses some of the things we talked about earlier at the top of the hour. Um, how your vote relates to policing. We have this document. Um, it, you can find it at njisj.org forward slash um, vote underscore on underscore policing. You'll find this document. We released it last week and it provides just information about how your vote for an elected official affects policing. And it goes step by step into who, uh, what their power is and what that means for policing. So from the governor to the mayor, 
to um, the uh, sheriffs, which are based, uh, you can vote on directly in New Jersey, though they're the county police, to state legislature, to municipal council, how your vote relates to policing. So we encourage you to take a look um, and use these resources for um, as you move forward and uh, um, you know be active and be civically engaged. Great, thank you, Hennel. Adorian. Yeah, so just a few quick things. Um, first is just to vote in your local elections. I can't stress how important that is, and I'm so glad that that came up today. You know, we know how important the presidential election is, but just as important are your local school board elections, your local mayoral elections, your assembly people uh, and the like. And so continue to vote for your, your local elections. I myself, when I ran for school board, only 4% of eligible voters in the city of Newark came and voted in that school board election. And this is for an election that is impacting the largest school district in the state of New Jersey. So please vote in all your elections and your local elections and encourage the young people in your lives to do the same. Second, register a young person to vote. Register a young person to vote. Uh, over the past four years, it's actually been a really great increase in terms of the youth vote in the state of New Jersey. And so it's gone from around 11% to 33% of youth in the, in the state of New Jersey between the 18, ages of 18 and 29 have voted. Again, 33% is progress, but it's not enough. So if you have a young person in your life, be that a niece, a nephew, a child, a granddaughter, a student, register them to vote. It's not too late for them to be able to vote for the November elections. Third, hold your elected officials accountable. Um, as we talked about here, uh, representation itself is not liberation. We need accountability to hold those elected into office accountable to our interests. And so that means showing up to public meetings. That means uh, going off online on social media if you have to because you're not getting a response when you come to the meetings. Uh, that means literally not even being a voice just for yourself and your own needs of your family or your students, but also asking the question, well, who else's voice isn't at the table and how you can use your voice to raise uh, awareness for the, the needs of other people who aren't being discussed. We that folks of different races, uh, abilities, religions, classes, what have you, we all have a responsibility. And then last but certainly not least, this is both for the folks who are on the panel, but especially on the panel, I'm sorry, the call, but especially the young people who are here with us this evening, uh, run for office. We need more young people in office. Your voice matters. It's not enough for us to just listen to you. We need to be voting for you. So if you are a young person, I, that's right, I'm talking to you. I need you to run for something. I need, we need to hear you. Um, and if you know a young person who is, is inspired um, to do something like running for office, please encourage them. Um, you know, when I ran last year, like I said, I became, you know, the youngest woman elected to the school board. But that is not to me, that's not enough. Uh, we need more young voices. We need more fresh voices. The North Board of Education is actually, I'm lucky, happy to say, it's a really young and diverse group kind of intergenerationally, but there's a lot of work to do. So uh, encourage young people to vote and get elected and to run because our young people aren't just our tomorrow, they're our right now. Great, thank you, Dorian. And I'll close out with Chanel. All right, uh, Adorian, that, that was great. I love how you ended with run for something. People need to be running for things. I, I'll say this, since I've been meditating, eating healthier and voting, I've been a better person <laughs> because that's what this is about. This is about making sure that we see our act of voting, our act of understanding our senses as our act of self-care. In the midst of this entire health crisis, what we've seen are elected officials that are literally making decisions about the mental health and wellness of our communities at large. And, and the best way to hold them accountable is to make sure that we're voting, to make sure we're turning people out to the polls, and to make sure that we're holding them accountable. One other thing, someone asked a question, and I wanted to make sure that I got, I got to this. They said, why is voting in the primary important as we approach July 7th, which is election day? And I think it's an important question and I want everyone to know, no question is a bad question. 
because I found that some people are afraid to ask questions that will give them the whole understanding that they need in order to be able to truly exercise their vote and to truly become one with their voice. So I wanted to share this screen. Um, at, at Project Ready, we've been working uh, closely with our Essex County Clerk. Um, I just want to blow it up. Um, with the Essex County Clerk's Office in order to make sure that we can get the information out to our people. And I'm just showing the Democratic ballot for no other reason than it's the first ballot that I was able to pull up. But you'll see here that you are actually able to make a choice for president, for the president of the United States and their delegates. You're able to make a choice for who you decide to deem your senator. You're able to make a choice for the members of the House of Representatives, for your county clerk, who ultimately is responsible for making sure that the clerk's office has the resources and tools they need to be able to provide people with a, a fair a voting system. You're able to vote for freeholders and you're, you're also able to vote for freeholders. So this is the full gamut of the official ballot, the Democratic ballot, because there's also a Republican ballot that you'll be able to engage with here in New Jersey. Make sure that you take a moment to look into all of the different levels of government that are represented on this ballot, understand whom is being represented here and what they represent for you so that you can make an informed decision either from your home, because right now people are voting by mail at higher numbers, or I should say voting from home, that's our new terminology, or going out and going to the polls and casting your provisional ballot, unless you have a, a disability where you'll be able to engage in a ballot box or a, 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 a ballot box there, or going to an actual ballot box. In North New Jersey, we have about five across our city. If you visit northvotesbymail.org, uh, you'll be able to find out about some of the others. And in Essex County, we have tons of them. Go to the ballot box, drop it off. You'll be able to do that before uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, which is the cutoff time on election day. Uh, so there are a ton of opportunities to make sure that you exercise your vote. And I just wanted to make sure that people understood exactly what's at stake on the July 7th primary that's coming tomorrow. Thank you so much, Chanel. And I know that the panel, our amazing, amazing panel has talked about a lot of links and documents. All of the documents that the panelists have referred to, or most of the documents that the panelists have referred to are available on the NJPAC landing page at njpac.org slash take a stand. Again, that's njpac.org slash take a stand. So I'd like to thank, again, our awesome, awesome, awesome panel. There's a lot of information, a lot of great information. We are technically supposed to go till 8.30. I'm hoping we can get a couple minutes over maybe, if possible, from NJPAC, just to make sure we get to as many great questions as possible. So I've tried to pull these questions from three different places. So hopefully I'm getting to ones, I tried to find ones that um, had been repeated. So the first question from the audience, I think I'd like to direct to Chanel and Hennel um, because there seems to be a lot of questions around tomorrow. And Chanel, you spoke about it a little bit in your ending, but I just wanna make sure people are crystal clear about this. So three kind of questions came out that were more logistics about tomorrow um, and November actually. One, why are votes provisional tomorrow? Two, do we know what's happening in November yet? Like we're talking about tomorrow, but what's going on in November? And then three, Hennel, someone asked, will the cure notice around the signature issue be sent by mail or email? So I'll, I'll touch base, whichever one of you wants to kind of lead us off with those answers. So go quite, Hennel, did you want to lead with the signatures? Sure, I can say um, the, uh, if there's an issue with your signature, they're going to mail it to you um, for tomorrow's election. Um, that's how the counties have every, the, the counties have everyone's addresses. They don't really have everyone's email addresses. So, um, uh, so they're going to mail you your notice. Um, I'll turn it over to Chanel to add, but I'll, I'll make a note. We don't know what the election in November looks like yet. <laughs> um, the decision will be made at some point, but it, um, you know, it's really going to depend um, on where we are in the pandemic. And the question, uh, the first question, why is it provisional? Honestly, it's because they just need to cross check, um, you know, that, someone of, of that you know just you voted only e, um, either provisionally or vote by mail once you um because they're getting so many vote by mail ballots it's easier for them to check in the back so that 
a, you know, a, they, they know um, that there's only one vote per person. It's a, it's a check. I know that there's been some questions people have been worried about voter fraud, all that stuff. Actually, there's very, very little voter fraud, um, individual voter fraud, little to none in the country. And the reason being things like this, we have processes in place. Um, and so they're, you're voting by provisional because of that um, uh, it, tomorrow. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, there are so many people that I engage with on a daily basis who are incredibly concerned about the vote by mail process and the provisional ballot process. They, they are untrusting of the processes at hand. And what I'll say, and one of the things that I love about the work that Andrea is doing, the work that Hinal is doing is we have to be active participants and what they are in the, the methods and tools they are putting before us in order to ensure that we are voting. So for example, and I'll mention this a couple of times, there have been ballots in our past election, a significant amount of ballots that were overall rejected. Making sure that we're doing the work in between now and November's election to ensure that every ballot cast is counted, that no ballot cast is rejected, and that people have equal opportunity access to being able to vote is something that's on all of us, not just Project Ready, not just the Institute, not just She Wins. It's something that's on every single person that is viewing this. So if you are engaged in, engaging in a part of the voting process that's not making sense to you, or that doesn't add up to you, or that doesn't feel right for you, Speak out about it so that we can make sure that we address it collectively so that as we approach November and elections beyond, we leave no stone left unturned. Thank you so much. And so this next question actually seems like it was handcrafted for Dorian. So the question is, how do we support and encourage young people to run for office, especially in New Jersey, where so many perceive that there's entrenched political machines that are hard to break through? How do young people get encouraged to vote in a system where it seems like the, the deck, the cards may be stacked against them? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I mean, I think on one end, we have to be honest, right? And that's acknowledging that political machines exist. Um, and, and that's real. Um, and so once we like just own that truth um, and know that it can be you know, a, a way in which that we get folks elected, but that also can create a barrier to entry, right? We have to be really honest about that truth. I think it comes down to us, again, like creating an ongoing ecosystem where we are letting young people and the citizenry at large know that their voices matter and not just when we want to get our candidates elected. Right. So one of the things I love about an organization like Sadie Nash, I know a number of my young people even have gone through that program, is that year round, right, they're talking about uh, voting, they're talking about civic engagement. At She Wins, every day we talk about current events and how do you engage those current events so that you can feel empowered. So we have to have, you have to have a paradigm shift where both in our political machines locally or at the county, where we're not just saying, oh, go out and vote because there's an election in like two months and we have certain candidates we're pushing. We need to be registering and encouraging people to vote all the time, right? The NAACP in Newark is a great example of that. There is never a point where you don't see Miss Deborah Gregory Smith and the whole team at the NAACP Newark not registering folks to vote. Um, so it takes uh, or grassroots organizations, community leaders, it takes educators, right? Those of us who have access to young people, letting our young people know that like we need to hear from you all the time and your voice matters all the time not just when we um have certain folks we want to get into office and again i think it comes down to to having candidates that people are excited about you know i, I remember last year uh board members and i we went to the uh the national uh national conference for urban board members in in miami and they're about three quarters of our board is like under the age of 40. So we're sitting at this table, right? And there are people who come up to us and they're like, oh, you guys must be some college interns. Cause they all were like over the age of 60, which is fine, right? Cause I think that's important that we have that various generations in space, but they were so alarmed just to see a number of people under the age of 40 elected into office. 
because it's not even common, as common as we think, to see millennials and Gen Z and other folks from different generations represented in the seats of power. So, and so when we ask the question of why aren't young people engaged as they should be, or why aren't other aspects of the electorate as engaged as they should be, part of it is because they aren't seeing who they are reflected in these seats. So we have to do a better job of getting a, a more diverse set of folks running and again, also encouraging folks to be engaged politically, not just when we need them, but all the time. Awesome. Exactly. I was going to do a little snaps, but exactly that. And so, Denise, I think this question was actually handcrafted for you because I think someone was probably moved by your um, graphics, but do people have a say in the redistricting process? Like, if I'm a community member, do I have a say in how my districts are drawn? So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so the answer is yes in the answer is yes in that you have the power to re elect the people who are in charge of creating of redrawing those districts so that's why more than ever especially this year all districts in our country are going to be redrawn in the spring once um in 20 in spring of 2021 once all, all the data is presented so who you're voting for right now in your primary elections are who are going to be in charge of recreating those districts and ensuring and you know we want people who are going to represent our best interests not people who are going to want to draw districts that break up our community and aren't accurate of the people who are living there. Um, and in particular, especially with upcoming elections. Great. Um, and so this next, and I'll just ask two more questions before NJ Pack pulls us off. Um, so this question came in and this one is for everyone. So obviously right now in this moment, we're seeing a big social media push. Everyone's social media talking about the vote, talking about protesting. How do we make sure that we can translate that power and energy from social media to people actually turning out to vote in the upcoming elections. And this is for everyone. Can we? <laughs> it will start the can we translate that? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> I mean, uh, tell me if I, I'm being too optimistic, but uh, Dorian, you mentioned the Newark school board election. Um, that typically is the has the lowest voter turnout across Newark. It's typically coming in at 5%, 7% of Newark residents who are actually engaged in a very important election. And just this past election, we saw a 23% increase um, based in a 100% in a vote by mail election. Now, are, were there kinks in it? Absolutely. Are there tons of things that we need to keep continue to be fixing? Absolutely, that's on us. But we did see that increase. And so I, I think that I'm optimistic based on, again, getting back to what we said at the tippy top of this conversation, which is that the, the movement that we're in right now, specifically the Black Lives Matter movement, and the way it's activated well over 10% of Americans, which is huge, and, and, and that we're talking millions of people that are daily protesting and or acting, I'm hopeful that we'll be seeing, as the NAACP once quoted, we'll be seeing souls going to the polls. We'll be seeing that. And I think the only way to ensure that that happens is for us to grab our friends, to grab our family members, call them and or walk with them and or uh, drive them to our polling places, to our ballot boxes, to make sure that they understand what's at stake, because some people legitimately don't, and they actually exercise their vote. I, maybe I'm optimistic, ladies, but I, I think we're gonna see something on July 7th and beyond because we don't get our results right away. I'll, um, I just wanna add a couple of things on that. I, I'm with you, I'm generally optimistic. I also think, I mean, just by the sheer numbers, I truly believe that this election in November is gonna be one of the highest uh, turnout elections um, in probably US history that we've, at least in our lifetime, certainly. And um, that I'm not just saying that um, with just optimism, um, the 2018 midterm election was one of the highest turnout uh, midterms um, in US history. So it, it, there is definitely interest in the presidential level. The question is, does it trickle down to um, down the ballot where things are uh, so important for what we're talking about for actual change, 
specifically on um, policing, on racial justice issues, um, if, on state and local races? That's a good question. And that, um, I am optimistic, like Chanel, I do think we're going to see an increase um, through these races. I think people have just become much more inclined to care and ask questions about police budgets, for example. That, that right in and of itself is beyond any conversation people anyone was having six months ago um, that and in terms of what is civic is civic engagement and that will translate to um, voting to translate to holding um, elected officials accountable but there's also other things right to um, Andrea said will it and then she also said can oh, can we right will uh, uh, will we and can we and the can we is an interesting one because there are genuine um, barriers in place I hear this all the time. People are like, oh, people are protesting in the streets. Why don't they vote? You know, all these thousands of young people, why don't they show up to vote? There's barriers. I, look at it right now. Right now in New Jersey, you, to register to vote, you have to either print out a, a registration form yourself or call the county or if you know someone who happens to be doing registration. Because in the last few months, we couldn't hold registration drives because of COVID. We don't have online voter registration set up. We had that law finally passed in January. It was supposed to go into effect a couple of weeks from now. And the governor just signed an executive order late last week that, said, that delay, is delaying it to September. We don't have online voter registration. So how do you register to people to vote? You do it old school style. Who has a printer? I don't have a printer that works at home. Um, so we have these barriers in place and people are, and how do you encourage young people if you can't even have, meaningfully make the, uh, access to the ballot easier. There's lots of other things like that. We've talked about lack of civics education. We don't teach people these things. So it, these are things that we can do, people who care, advocates, and anyone who's listening really to work on. We can act, advocate for these issues. We can work on, we can help people. Chanel said, bring people to the poll. Yes, um, register people. You know people, help them register. Registration numbers have plummeted in the last few months. Uh, they just have the numbers are significantly down than they have been in past years and for an election this big this anticipated this year that's uh, ridiculous except that we're in a pandemic we have 83,000 people who just got their right to vote restored people on parole and probation that was a huge fight the 1844 no more campaign that the institute leads we've been fighting for this for a long time we won that in um, in in December 83,000 people have the right to vote effective March 17th March 17th might uh, stand out to you because it was around the same time COVID hit. So you had a bunch of people who got their right to vote back and almost no way to register to vote. Um, so what do you do here? So do, if you can, help people. Um, and that's the can we part of it. You can engage people, talk to them, help people, talk about civics, provide resources and help people get access to the ballot. Change the culture, if you will, on voting. Great, so I was told we could go to 8.45. So I'm gonna try and get in two more questions. Um, this is again for everyone. So something that has resounded tonight is civics education. And we know that's something that Professor Linda Carter has felt very strongly about and has advocated for fervently for years. So are there any plans underway right now that anyone knows about to bring mandatory civics education back into the schools? Do any of your organizations have like civics education kind of programs that can kind of be slotted into the schools. What is actually happening? Because we know how important, everyone knows how important it is. Do we know what's happening on the ground with moving towards mandatory civics education, quality mandatory civics education? So, I can, uh, shout out, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dorian. No, I was just gonna say, well, first I have to tell Hanel, I'm, I was looking around because I literally have a stack of voter registration papers like right here in my living room because every other day I'm getting texts from my young people because you know a lot of my kids just graduated high school and say oh I want to register to vote so I'm gonna find this I'm literally over the, these past few months I've been getting these into the hands of young people so I'm so glad you brought those up I'm sure they're in one of these piles but uh what I can speak to at least some of the work that's being done in, in the North Public School so I can't speak formally as a representative of the board because you know technically as board members we're not allowed to do that but what I can talk to you a little bit about is just some of the work that's happening um and so what Again, you mentioned Professor Linda Carter, right, who is someone I consider a mentor and an accomplice for oh, I was a teenager. You're breaking up a little bit. Um, oh, adoring, we can't, we can't hear you. You got pixelated. She is 
Adorian, can you hear me? Um, Adorian? Can you hear me? You got a picture. Okay. Oh, man. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. We can't sit. You're not moving, but we can hear you. I think. No, we can't hear you. Oh, no. You're I, all I gotta say, too. like, I feel like I should have my, um, how about now? Okay, oh, so, God. so uh, Yeah, so you have a picture now. Okay, okay. I think we can hear you now. Okay, okay. I'm not moving. I, I, how about now? Yep, we can hear you. Listen, let me tell y'all, I think that you can just officially revoke my millennial card. <laughs> at this point, it's just like, it's crazy. Um, but all I was saying was that, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to, oh man, I actually lost part of my chance. Oh, okay, what's happening here in York? Yes. Um, so uh, basically, one of the things that's happening here in the district is that we're focusing really hard on actually list. People have been advocating, like you said, for years for us to have education. Um, we have ways in which it's been implemented in some of our schools, but right now the district is working on actual district-wide policy that would institute that this is something that's taught K-12 for all of our kids. Um, for me, I chair the program and instruction committee. And so one of the policies that we've been talking about and that we're going to work on this summer is actually having it be mandatory um that in our school there's curriculum written uh k-12 not just at our uh, elementary level because from the k-5 level we tend to find it's still off um okay try, try hello he's yeah. still, still struggling yeah <laughs> yeah okay I, I'll just close by saying uh, there's a lot of great work happening here in the state of New Jersey and in Newark in particular. There's still a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, and I think that we all have a hand in, in getting it there. I'm going to just end there in case I have any other <laughs> issues with the tech. So yeah, thank you. Okay, and if, I could, if I could just uh, jump in, um, hopefully uh, a Dorian and school board members and, and uh, the honorable superintendent coming to you um, is a, a, a hopeful, and I'm just calling this into existence because that's what you have to do, um, a hopeful partnership in between the League of Women Voters and Project Ready, where we can bring mock trials to Newark, New Jersey. I'm sorry, not mock trials, mock elections. Uh, to Newark, New Jersey, um, where the students in high school in particular across the entire district have the opportunity to be able to engage in a mock election surrounding the Newark School Board, where they actually can understand a little bit more about what the school board does, who the school board members are, and be able to engage in a, a mock voting system where they can go to the ballot box and begin to really engage with it because like we've all mentioned collectively, voting is just the beginning, understanding the ballot box, assuming ballot boxes uh, come back to us, uh, understanding the vote by mail ballot, uh, understanding polling sites, et cetera, are all things that need to be taught um, and should be being taught at the, at the very beginning. I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old and I'm already trying to teach them about voting and justice. Um, so I, I'm just gonna call it into existence and hopefully the next time I'm with you ladies, I can actually say that this is something that is happening. Final thing I'll mention is uh, Project Ready recently joined with uh, joined forces with Michelle Obama's uh, organization, When We All Vote, um, with the priority to be able to bring voter registration to a higher number here in the city of Newark, New Jersey. Um, and we're excited to really get on the ground and partner with our youth that make up about 34% of the unregistered voter um, so that we can have them activated and registered. Um, I just have one quick thing I want to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Denise. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Hanal. 
Um, so one thing I wanted to add and just kind of, I'm, I love what I'm hearing at Dorian saying, Chanel, uh, about all the plans that we have to incorporate this. And one thing that we really do at Sadie Nash is the critical consciousness building, right? So it's not just enough to teach voting and teach the census, but why it's important, it's history, you know, and kind of going back in where the wrongs were done and what has been done to correct it and the work that's still needed. And, you know, this is something that we continue to do in the city of Newark. And we had our campaign census that had less than a hundred Nashers who pushed up our youth participated and they were able to reach over 30,000 people. You know, this is just what a little bit of education for less than a hundred group for less than a hundred youth, you know, who were just activated with their social justice, with what's going on right now. And that's the power that they held. So I think, should we do civic education, it really needs to translate in a way that just continues to promote all of these, um, these the importance of civic engagement right so it's not just civic education but also civic engagement and what what power you hold and again bringing it back to this concept that um this what adorian mentioned earlier about youth really holding the power uh just really quick wanted to mention um everything they said but there is a bill pending in the state legislature i'll give everyone the bill number S-854-237, they actually combine two bills. It is, um, it passed through one committee in the Senate. It is now a Senate appropriations. Um, and then th there's a whole legislative process, but it's, st it's still relatively early stages. But the bill uh, would require, it would um, mandatory civics education in middle and high school. And it would create, um, it also requires the, cr the creation of a curriculum. Um, and then um, requiring it for middle school and um, high school. So there is some momentum to actually get that pushed forward earlier this year than COVID hit. Um, uh, and the legislature has been a little distracted, if you will, but that's okay. You guys can um, call your elected officials and hold them accountable. Say you want civics education. I'm gonna, I'll put the bill number in the chat box, but tell them, you know, let's go. They have a bill, let's move it. Great, thank you, Hennel. And I'll actually leave that as the last question, not to say that none of these other questions are important. We just had so much to talk about and get to, but again, documents that the panelists mentioned are available at njpac.org slash take a stand. I know they've also included their organization's uh, URLs within the chat box, but thank you, thank you, thank you again to our wonderful panel. I know I learned a lot um, and this was a wonderful experience. Please turn out for primary day tomorrow. Make sure your votes are counted, follow up, track as necessary, and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to turn it now over to Donna walker Kuhn again to close us out. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, what an incredible panel. We so deeply appreciate your passion, your creativity. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for moderating such a great discussion. Our panelists, A. Dorian, Chanel, Denise, Hanel. We are so fortunate that you are part of our NJPAC family. I'd also like to thank the NJPAC Social Justice Programming Task Force uh, for their ongoing commitment for us to deliver not only information, but solid action steps for our community to take to transform our society. And so tonight was our launch, our first event. Our next event will be on July 20th, Monday, July 20th at 7 p.m. We are launching the PSEG True Diversity Film Club. And with this film club, we'll be providing links to screen various films, and then we'll gather together to have panel discussions. So the film, first film will be Ava DuVernay's film, 13th. And so we'll be sending out the link on how you can watch this for free, and then join us on July 20th for another stimulating discussion moderated by Rick Thickpin from PSNG, Dr. Stephanie James Harris, Rick Robinson, Professor Brandon Paradise, Dr. Bahia Mohammed and Cleo Nicole Torres. And so again, another great dynamic event in July. August, we have a whole new schedule of activity. So please visit our website. All this great information and the video from tonight will be there, njpac.org. Take a stand. So thank you so much. Please remember, register to vote and then vote tomorrow. Please complete the census. We can change this world. We can do it together. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.